In today's episode of the podcast, I sat down with Aidan Dobkin. Aidan is a writer and journalist whose work has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, The Atlantic, The Paris Review, The Los Angeles Review of Books, and other publications. Interestingly enough, he's also the co-host of a very good, in my opinion, history podcast called War Stories. It looks at the development of warfare through the accounts of individuals at various points in history. But in this particular history podcast episode, Aiden and I talk about his latest book, Sprinting Through No Man's Land. The book is about the 1919 Tour de France, and it explores how ordinary people through this racing event were able to rebuild and unite after the devastating catastrophe that was World War I. So we talk about conflict as a lens into cultural history. We talk about the 1919 Tour de France and its relationship to World War I. We talk about the overall psychological and emotional impact of World War I. We talk about sporting events and how they connect with national identity. We talk about the role of the bike in World War I, in women's history, the role of the bicycle in history in general, and much more. As always, thanks for listening, and I hope you find something of value. I figured we'd start maybe... Um, you could introduce yourself maybe and and give your sort of background and history and what what got you to start thinking about World War One and the nineteen nineteen Tour de France. Yeah, absolutely. So my name's Aiden Dobkin. I'm a writer and journalist and writing teacher. And I started sprinting through no man's land and, and this idea of a post World War One book quite a few years ago i mean the the particular story of the 1919 race came to me in march or april of 2018 when i was working on a different book that surrounded some of these same ide same ideas which was how i've always been interested in you know using conflict as a lens through which to view some of these other elements of the human experience most often being cultural elements, whether that's writing or, you know, philosophical movements or social developments or what have you. And and so I started working on a novel because at the time I was interested in 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 kind of branching out from the journalism that I had been doing for a couple of years at that point and started working on a story about a, an American soldier who walks to the south of France in the months after World War I. Um, my interest was partially in kind of the cultural movements that were growing at that time, but also looking at the landscape that someone like that would have encountered. And I began to do some preliminary research in order to ground that narrative in a sense of place. So I kind of started looking at events and and, and whatnot that that soldier would have been encountered. And I realized in the process that the 1919 Tour de France passed right by the town that I had set the novel in. And I was you know, well familiar with, you know, studying and writing about World War One for a few years by that point in kind of what France looked like that looked like at the time physically, um, but also emotionally and psychologically and and said to myself, you know, that's that's really, really soon after the war ended, much sooner than I had expected. And and, you know, to some degree I'd never really thought about that particular conjunction of the race and World War One before. Um, so I did a little bit more digging and and found just the the most basic elements of the 1919 race, being who started and who finished, in what order, and 
where did they ride? And that information alone was enough to kind of set me on a new track, kind of set down the the novel and start work on this nonfiction proposal, because I realized that, you know, just months after the the war ended, these cyclists were traversing the entire border, which meant traversing the Western Front. And so many of them who started the race didn't wind up finishing. And I, and I knew in that moment that assuming there were the sources to allow me to kind of recreate the minute path they took and what they would have encountered, that this was a story worthy of a, of a book length project. Yeah, I, I think that's interesting. Um, and just reading your book, I think that's, you know, part of the, the story there is that we, a lot of times when we learn history, sort of the way history gets taught, we think of things in very concrete terms and there's facts and dates and events and, you know, World War One ended in 1918 or the treaty was 1919 and then it's over. But as you're kind of pointing out in this book, what's what's sort of interesting about this Tour de France is the as the cyclists are going around France, they're seeing all of the ways that while the war is over, it's really not over because people are still sort of picking up the pieces and they're dealing with the, you know, emotional drama of, you know, losing loved ones and the landscape is destroyed. And I wondered if you could talk about some of the obstacles that you know, that just were there to even having the Tour de France to begin with in 1919. Yeah, so there are kind of both macroscopic and microscopic details that really turned this race, which was always difficult and extreme, and some people thought ill-founded into something even more extreme and perhaps more ill-founded, at least just months after the end of the war. Um, you have everything from economic imbalances based on the fact that former sponsors of teams had to retool for government contracts, um, and then kind of once the war was over, not sure how those newly kind of shifted plants might or might not work with, uh, you know, civilian, uh, projects. I mean, you know, Peugeot, uh, you know, factories wound up diversifying and building not necessarily just those things they were most well suited to build based on what they had done before, but those things that were most needed by the government. So you see small factories that maybe worked on buttons or things like that uh, because they were working with metal might start building shell casings and things like that. So it wasn't super close one to one developments of material for the war and that means that once the war was over those those factories didn't really know how they were what sort of support they might get from the government in order to you know convert factories back so teams were wildly different in the 1919 race there was essentially one french team la sportive that wound up supporting most of the French and Belgian professional cyclists controlling their salaries, um, as well as the prize package, which was declined in, in, in sums from the preceding years. So those are kind of, that's like one of the, the big kind of macroscopic elements of how the race changed. I mean, there were tire shortages based on labor strikes that have been going on throughout the summer as, um, you know, there, there's this, there's this desire in the people and this necessity in many, many social groups to take advantage of this perceived blank slate at the end of a devastating war to say, you know, what led us to this point? What went wrong? How might we be able to build something better? And really trying to push those elements, which led to social, political, economic strife throughout the interwar years. Um, but then there are also those super microscopic or relatively microscopic factors that affected how the cyclists' day-to-day -day existence on the race went. Um, you know, the the tour organizer, Henri de Grange, wanted the 1919 tour to be just as intense, just as complete as any race before. 
And that meant riding through the Western Front. That meant riding on roads that were destroyed, stopping in towns that could barely accommodate the cyclists. So you have these anecdotes along the way of tour cyclists who, you know, had to stay in flop houses or barracks or could, you know, ran out of water along the course because uh, water wells and things like that in certain stretches of the route were few and far between. And, you know, this was, as mentioned, a race that was as intense and complete as anything before. So those cyclists who had only been in uniform months before, sometimes weeks before, didn't have the training that they would have had in other years. And still they were expected to ride on, you know, what would be the second longest tour in history. Yeah, I think it it might be worth, you know, talking about for people who aren't that familiar with the Tour de France, like this is a incredibly extreme event um it's basically a a month-long uh intense race around france and these are professional cyclists most of them who are you know getting up every morning and riding dozens hundreds of miles over the course of uh, a month and as you said in the book i think most of the cyclists actually didn't make it to the end they they tapped out yeah these were Wildly difficult conditions. I mean, the race itself, when Henri de Grange and the journalists at Lotto founded it, was unlike any other race at the time. And and a lot of professional cyclists didn't even really kind of know what to do with it. And still in 1919, while people understood the importance of the race, it was still wildly different from almost every other bicycling race in existence. You know, you had one day races that were between one city and another that was, you know, 300, 400, sometimes 500 kilometers, but was just a single day race. You had multi-day races that took place on a cycling track, but this was a race that put 15 of those one day races together, not at shortened distances, but as long and sometimes longer than any uh, that a cyclist might encounter on a single day. And on top of that, Henri de Grange had this idea for the tour as a truly independent race that expected the winner to not only be the fastest cyclist, but obviously one of them with the with the greatest amount of endurance but also who could repair his cycle uh, or bicycle along the course who could sustain himself you know their t- teams and tour administrators gave the cyclists certain accommodations um in the 1919 race there is um you know, because of the difficulties, greater assistance for the cyclists to find accommodation, uh, you know, greater kind of centralized accommodations and food. But when the cyclist was riding, it was him in a single bicycle frame and whatever tubes that he could carry on his shoulders. And if something happened along the, the course that day, it was on him to repair it. And so it's totally different than the modern day tour where you have highly specialized supported cyclists who ride yes as individuals and that someone winds up winning the tour de france an individual winds up winning the tour de france but countless people helped make that happen back then Yes, teams existed to pay for salaries and other certain off-road, off-the-road assistance for the cyclists. But while they were riding, it was just the cyclist and themselves and their bike. And that independence combined with the distances that they crossed day after day really makes the race feel, even more than an ultra marathon, really like this adventure more than a highly sporty speedy race that we might 
think of these days. I think at, at some point in the book, you say that, I don't know if you say this directly, but you, you kind of imply that the the race itself sort of becomes a almost a parallel for World War I. You say as if winning had become only a matter of surviving after the others had fallen. And it really does seem like this race sort of turns into this endurance contest. And while there is characters, I shouldn't call them characters, people in the book racing and you kind of, you know, give their backgrounds and go into their stories and say how World War I really impacted them as they were riding through the race. I don't know if you intended it, but it seems like World War I itself is also a character as they're riding around France. They're seeing the towns, the villages, you know, the poison gas factories. They're riding through the Alps where the, you know, the Italians and the Austro-Hungarians were fighting on the forgotten front of the war. They're driving through the, riding through the Western Front, as you said, uh, the trenches. They're, you know, seeing the shell holes, the crater holes. And it really does seem like this race has World War One sort of looming over it, uh, which, you know, so, sort of goes to show that there is this element of even though the war is over, it's going to have this lingering effect, not just on France, but really on the whole world. Yeah, there is the construction of the Tour de France and the ways in which it interacted with the average French person made it such that the tour is really bound up in contemporary French politics from almost the first moment that it exists. Um, it, it is partly an outgrowth of the Dreyfus affair where a Jewish French army officer was um, put on trial for collaborating with Germans. The tour or Lotto's founding is partly a political act. And so Yes, I was interested in this event. You know, I was interested in the unique quality of the tour as a sporting event in this like really close proximity between those who watch the tour and those who ride in it, both physically and, and you know, people standing on the sides of roads, but also emotionally in how people gave small prizes to cyclists who rode through their town first. And so I'm interested in the race in that way, but I'm interested in sports and the intersection of the war and, and how this particular race interacted with the war and the landscape. And that that was really where I came to this story from, not as a cycling enthusiast, even though I, I like watching the tour, but in the fact that it rode through the entire border of France, how that gave a lens through which I could view this country at this very particular moment in time. In the months just after a totally devastating war where that was, you know, the war to end all wars, though, of course, it wasn't. And I wanted to look at the psychology and the landscape of the place. And the tour helped create an arc and a journey by which to view those various locations and those people who were just starting to think about what their lives would look like at the end of the war. Going along with that, at, at one point in the book, I'll, I'll just quote you here. You say, quote, Both the cyclists and those who watched them ride along the Parisian roads were surprised at the other's existence, surprised that the race could continue so soon after the war, that men were willing or able to ride in it, even those who were paid for their effort. Those men had still willingly set down their regained lives to ride through a terrain most would do anything to avoid, that they had been unable to avoid not so long ago. So you sort of uh, paint this picture of people kind of, you know, creeping out of their homes or towns or villages to watch these cyclists ride by. And it's almost like, are, are things going back to normal? Uh, maybe there's this, this sort of implicit argument that you might make in the book. I don't know um, if that's something you were intending to do, but it says... <laughs> 
something along the lines of maybe that the Tour de France here is helping to give France sort of a a sense of national identity or a sense of healing um, after the war. Do you think that's something that is accurate or no? You know, I don't know that I think it is a lasting feeling, obviously. I think that it is a temporary distraction more than a true rebuilding. But if you look at the longer arc of the race, there are certain qualities about the Tour de France due to its structure and the close association between amateurs and professionals and all these other things that have really made it larger than its founder's grandest aspirations. There are There's research that's been done that talks about how the average French person at the top before the tour was in existence would have had a more regional sense for what their country was like. They knew which towns they interacted with as well as their whole as well as, you know, the town that they lived in. And they might know something about what major features were around, but they didn't necessarily have a sense for the entire boundary of their country. And then here was this race, this sporting event that didn't just take place in the largest cities, but rode through these tiny towns and included a map of the entire country where people could see, here is my town, here are the towns that the cyclists rode through before and after. And so the tour does have this place of on one level, just practical geographic knowledge and education in the country, which I think indicates the larger place it holds in the mind of people. And, you know, it's of course impossible to separate Henri de Grange's professional financial legacy based interests in holding the race so soon after the war. But, you know, he is a master storyteller. He is a master promoter. And the way that he cultivated the 1919 race was that this is a race that has always traced the bounds of this country. And now it is tracing the new bounds of this country with the Alsace-Lorraine and the other territories that were won back by France. And so it is larger than a race for people and whether that is whether that cultivates a real long lasting rebuilding i think you know we can't say i mean in some ways the entire interwar period before world war ii is one of aspiration that is aspiration and conflict over you know, what of those future worlds or past worlds is going to be rebuilt. But it does at least give that moment of continuity of understanding that the these things, this country still exists in a way that is recognizable to people despite all the devastation. Yeah, I I wanted to ask you actually, you know, maybe not so much as it relates to, you know, this specific event, but given that you're someone who has studied the way that a sporting event can sort of interact with the culture and the politics, as you said, of a certain time period, what do you think is the role of sort of sports in the world? Because as I was reading this this book, I I couldn't help but think just some of the ways that people interacted with this sporting event, the Tour de France, would be very different than the way that sports seems to interact in the culture and the politics of today's world. Maybe this is just my opinion, but sometimes it feels like sports can be, you know, more divisive nowadays, whereas it seems like, you know, back in the day, it was more of sort of a unifying factor and maybe that's just something where, you know, narratives get told and, you know, I might be sort of buying into that narrative of, you know, sports being a unifying thing. 
Um, but I was curious, what what do you think on that? Are, are sports more of a divisive or or unifying thing in relation to the culture and the politics of a given time period? Yeah, I think that there are divisive elements of the race up through its founding, but as far as a national spirit within France is concerned, it is more unifying than not through in in that particular kind of lens. Um, you know, the race carefully chooses up through the end of World War II and, and onward for a bit of time, who competes in the race. You know, Belgians are are included. Um, Frenchmen are obviously also included. Um, Germans are included for a brief bit of time, then not included, then included again eventually. Um, same with Italians. Uh, British and Americans and, and other more international, a wider international collection of cyclists gradually start to join alongside the kind of growing international nature of cycling. But, you know, there's always an element within the tour administrators and, and those who watch it that, you know, of course, you want a, a Frenchman to win the race. And there is a particular nationalist element, not not necessarily a corrosive national element but nationalist element but you know it's it's unsurprising that a race that traces around the the border of france and now a kind of slightly abbreviated form is going to privilege those uh cyclists who come from the country itself and and i think that there is this debate that winds up playing out between de Grange and his successor in the 1930s before World War II, where de Grange is a is is rabidly anti-German, anti-Nazi, uh, whereas his successor, who's younger than him, who I think more accurately represents kind of the midpoint of French politics at the time sees the months leading up to World War II before France enters World War II, at least, as an opportunity to kind of have this event that that shows um, sports can rise above this particular conflict. And, and he winds up not allowing the t tour to continue during the occupation of France, but um, was more ready to allow Germans to compete and, and to kind of um, have the tour exist as this space without politics. And, you know, I think that that gestures to the fact that, yes, within the country it was unifying, but not always. And, 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 and there were active decisions made to figure out, you know, what could gather up the largest collection of, of French people to support the race and at the same time allow the race to continue. So I don't know. I, I, I think sports are this, I, I, I don't, I don't have a good answer for you. I think sports are, you know, unifying if you view them through the right lens, but of course, hinge upon competition and it's impossible to kind of separate them from the context that they exist in, which is really part of why I wrote the book in the way that I did is that I wanted to tell the story of how the Tour de France played off of and existed in this particular world and was not separate and a part of it where these people were just heroes of endurance and athleticism, but were individuals who were thinking about their own financial interests and legacy and these cyclists who were sometimes, you know, ab abused or at least, you know, harshly treated for because a sports administrator 
had a particular idea of what the race should be and was willing to do anything to make it so. And I think, you know, they can be unifying and, and divisive at the same time. And I just wanted to include all of that within the scope of this book to kind of try and talk about that entire context. I did want to ask you, sort of embedded in the, you know, in the story of the Tour de France, you're always talking about these um these cyclists who have to kind of repair their own bikes and that's like a big part of the story is just the relationship that the racer has with their bicycle and i was wondering if you could maybe talk about the role of the bike in world war 1 because a lot of these a lot of these racers in the tour served in the war and were actually still in the military while they were doing this race and I wonder if you could talk about sort of what they did in the war and the role that the bike played in that. Yeah, so I think one of the the great and unique factors about bicycle racing is the bike itself is not just this purely athletic device, but you know, we're all familiar with, you know, the practical reasons one might own a bike which kind of define and, and are the reason for some of the integration of amateurs and professionals in the race. And I think in how we view bicycle racing as, as a little bit different and more proximate to like the average person's experiment experiences, because, you know, you can get on a bike and ride it and be practically conveyed to another more distant place you might not be able to walk to or might not want to walk to. And, and during the race or during the war, rather, the, this this takes on a new shade, which is cycling units, which convey themselves to and from the front or from different parts of the front. And for those privileged few cyclists, which oftentimes were the slightly older cyclists who maybe weren't doing their first mandatory tour of duty in the French military. So during that time, one was served in the French army for a mandatory 28 years total. You you served a few years uh, at the beginning as, you know, a standard active duty um, soldier, poilu, um, and then kind of gradually progressed to lower and lower or, you know, more distant forms of reserve service. And, and during the war, of course, all of those various reserve uh, units are called up. And, and, but for those cyclists who had maybe already done their active service but were now in reserve units, they sometimes had the opportunity to take part in these bike bicycle units either as mechanics or as or as riders, whereas some of the younger soldiers um, were just parts of line infantry units, which was you know the bulk of what was needed at the time. And that was a real boon for those individuals who, were able to serve in those units. You know, the bike was not, and bicycling was not just a simple professional activity for them. It was really part of their identity, part of their lives. And for those who were in line infantry units, they would have been away from from a bike for for years. Um, you know, maybe they would have had a chance on on leave to to ride one, but certainly never to train, and certainly never to kind of regularly be in contact with their bikes. So it was really good and pleasant and and directly contributed to how the race played out to have some of these older cyclists who were able to do just a little bit on their bikes in those four years to train on them, to ride on them, to repair them, even to race in certain one day races. And that really winds up shaping the the 1919 race and who is most able to convey themselves across these distances yeah it is you know as i was reading the book it kind of stuck out to me it's just sort of some of the forgotten and sort of the you know the added sadness of world war one you know these people who for a lot of them you know bicycling and the bike was a big part of their lives and their passion and their, you know, the thing they did. And then the war comes and basically that gets taken away and you just sort of, uh, 
magnify that for all the people who were serving in the war. And it wasn't just about, you know, the the horrible conditions in World War One. Obviously, that is the primary concern. But a lot of these people lost their, you know, their passions and their ability to kind of, you know, live life and, you know, do what they wanted to do, um, which, you know, is, is kind of an underrated sadness, in my opinion, at least. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I think I was really, as I gestured to when talking about the birth of this story, was interested in this narrative of the race as one through which I could talk about that process of rebuilding in those first months. And part of the reason that I include these separate chapters about those who were watching the cyclists as they passed was that I, of course, can't definitively know the full motivations of of why the cyclists decided to ride in the 1919 race. I, I you know, they've been dead for a long period of time uh, and simply didn't write down their, their thoughts on this particular race. But in some ways, I viewed them competing in the race as, yes, it was going back to the old way in certain regards, but on the race itself, there were certain continuities between the war experience and this race, and, and I, I felt at the very least that this was not a period of time in which these cyclists were really rebuilding their lives. They did, you know, were not going home and kind of figuring out what their lives might look like, were, were not processing the war. They, on the course itself, it, it is, you know, one of tunnel vision. You're, you're starting out at two or three in the morning, riding until the evening have a day of rest, and then doing the same thing over again for an entire month. Um, but I was interested in talking about that process of rebuilding, and, and that's why I included some of the people who were watching the, side, you know, the, the tour that year, because I thought that those people spoke to these larger processes of rebuilding that the cyclists would eventually carry out or would attempt to carry out. It's not always a successful process of rebuilding. Um, but that was that was really important to me. And one of the first things I considered when thinking about the structure of this book is how could I talk about delayed rebuilding, stunted rebuilding, successful rebuilding in all its forms. One of those extra chapters that you you mentioned there was about the the role of the bike in women's history. And you make an argument that the bike actually played a big role in facilitating the process of women's suffrage and that sort of thing. I wonder if you could speak to that at all. I, I think it gestures to the practical elements of the bicycle, which are inseparable from its sporting elements. Um, the person who made that exact argument with Susan B. Anthony when she was being interviewed by Nellie Bly. And it speaks to the simple way by which a bicycle, particularly back then, can expand the radius of where one might be able to visit or journey to and by necessity do so independently. So the bicycle allowed women to venture out on their own to a wider area than they otherwise would have, oftentimes, you know, accompanied by someone else. And, you know, the, 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 the process of women's suffrage at the time, at least in France, was one of those kind of delayed rebuildings or delayed growth. Um, women, uh, there was, you know, not to get into a full discussion of kind of the suffrage movement at the time, but eventually kind of 
suffragettes supported the French government at, at the time during the war in an effort to show that they were on board with the project and they could be relied on to do their part and do their part independently when 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 men were away on the front. And after the war ended, it, it was expected that in exchange, they would be given the right to vote, which they were not. It was a much longer process that I think, if I'm remembering my dates correctly, it took until the 40s. Um, and so that particular element of women's development was delayed. But what the bike showed, um, which started, you know, in the late 1800s, was that women you know, could do all, women, you know, wanted and could and do all these things independently. And and there's even a a pretty good parity at the time between women and men, women and men cyclists, even if they were oftentimes separated, um, as opposed to running or something like that. And uh, I think it just is, is one of those elements of rebuilding that I was really interested in was talking about the fact that the bike wasn't just this athletic tool, but was this really practical, important, almost existential development for some people. Yeah. And it, it sort of is a nice parallel for the rest of the book where you're, you're talking about, you know, the race itself and sort of the internal components of that, but you're also branching out into the wider sphere of the 1919 landscape in France and how World War One affected it and how the tour bounces off that and how, you know, things are, as you're saying, either trying to rebuild or heal or it's a delayed process or maybe it's, you know, a super delayed process or maybe it never happens at all. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your sort of historical process, because as you said, you're trying to look into the racers themselves, you're trying to look into the people who are watching them, and you're trying to get into their heads to sort of understand what they're thinking, even though you don't necessarily have, you know, firsthand accounts that say, you know, here's what I'm thinking on this particular day. So how did you kind of go about writing this book, researching, um, you know, what was your process like? So... The process was more or less location-based. I was fortunate enough in this book to have the backbone of the race. You know, I had these ideas about what themes I was most interested in, in the process of rebuilding and talking about the changing landscape and in how sports as an element of culture aligns or misaligns or is given new cadence with the end of a war. But, you know, that's not enough to create a narrative arc. And so I was really fortunate in that the the, the race was going to be the, the element that I could always rely on and turn to as a way to explore these other facets. And so I started by taking Lotto, the, the newspaper that sponsored the race, organized the race, um, their itineraries for the cyclists every day, which were really minute down to the individual turn by turn on the street because they wanted people and, and, you know, people to stand by the side of the road and cheer the cyclists on and give them money and, and support them. And that was an important part of the race and, and still is in many ways. And, and so I, created a really minute map of, you know, where the cyclists would have been passing through. And that was what I I turned back to regularly. I then kind of branched out from there. I, based on my existing knowledge of the war and and the post-war movements, knew some of the themes that I wanted to explore, whether that was, you know, racism or suffrage or, um, you know, literally the, the process of physically rebuilding along the Western front. And I tried to correspond those ideas to 
what the cyclists would have been experiencing or viewing, even if they didn't have direct historical knowledge of what they were viewing. I kind of tried to imagine myself as a, an omniscient or semi-omniscient narrator following them on the side of the road who saw immediately what was around them, but also knew to some degree the significance of the things that they were seeing or hearing or feeling. And so that then kind of that location and scene based work, which, you know, took place in I in those itineraries in Google Earth drawings I made in following sections of the race in a car in France, then helped me branch out and try and connect those historical interests I had with as close to an on the ground experience as I could muster. Um, and, you know, I won't say what, how successful I was or not, but that was at least the intent I had going into it. Right. And I think it, uh, it really comes through in the book that there, you know, there is sort of this way that the, as we talked about, the history is connecting, but it's ultimately the individual people that matter and sort of their motivations and why they did the things they do and trying to piece that picture together, you know, must've been difficult. And I do think you did a good job of it. Um, and sort of going along with that, I think the, the larger scope of World War One, you know, one of the things that gets said about World War One, and I don't know if this is true or not, it might just be something that every generation sort of, you know, says about themselves, but I've heard it said that the the World War One generation, there's something unique about them where the things they experienced in the trenches, um, just living there and fighting there and going over the top again and again that nobody else could have done that. And there's no, you know, there's no sort of comparison to the toughness and the sort of mental fortitude that it took uh, to, to just do that over and over again um, during this war. So I wanted to ask you for the people who, for the racers who were in this 1919 race as their riding through the ruins of France and buildings are torn down and there's just debilitated ruins of places and the economies are messed up and, you know, it's, it's difficult on that front. Plus they're, you know, going through miles and miles of intense cycling and there's pressure and they don't have a lot of money and funds to sort of support them and they have to repair their own bikes and they're away from their families and, Basically, I'm asking, why do you think those few racers who did make it to the finish line, why do you think they kept going when others sort of bowed out? It's, of course, a hard and impossible question, but I'll, I'll do my best to answer it. Um, you know, on, on, on some level, at least a few of the cyclists who wound up doing particularly well were those who did embody that unique combination of athleticism, endurance, and practical know-how to convey themselves across this route despite breakages and flats and, you know, insufficient water and food and, and whatnot. Um, for those younger cyclists, I think there is this ambition to you know that for the for those old cyclists and for those young cyclists i mean the young cyclists are kind of catching up we're not able to train um are really kind of thrust into this environment with something to prove and those older cyclists have seen what should have been their most successful years of racing wasted in some ways by the war the um you know you have cyclists who are um three to five to 
eight years older than what would have been the most competitive cyclist in any other year of the race. And why they carry themselves across those distances is on one level knowable. I mean, the, the tour, despite the decline in a prize package, still did offer meaningful money for these cyclists. It was also more than a profession for them. It was, you know, a passion. It was, you know, like writing or something. It is, yes, something that some people make money on, but you don't, you can't just do it with a desire to make money. And and this was part of their lives and identities in a way that giving it up entirely would have been heartbreaking. Um, but you know, there are also those people who, you know, there is a there is a cyclist uh, by the name of Henri Plissier who rides in the 1919 tour who is arguably kind of the most professional of that year's crop of cyclists. Or he takes cycling as the most full-time activity, whereas some of the other cyclists in the off-season would have gone to other jobs or taken part in other types of races or things like that. This was someone who much closer to our contemporary version of an athlete, really spent long times training, uh, viewed it as a full-time job, uh, doped quite a bit for what it's worth. But, um, but he, but the tour was too much for him. He really came into conflict with Henri de Grange over how de Grange treated the cyclists as kind of not play things exactly, but uh, as devices for this race that he was a father of, and it causes him to quit, and and some years later quit um, the tour entirely. And so it, it is some element of being able to withstand punishment or a particular view of yourself as a cyclist to carry yourself across these distances back then because you know I do think for all his extreme and dramatic behavior at some time Henri Pelissier did have a genuine view of how a professional cyclist could be and how the tour and the tour administrators conducted themselves didn't accord with that and I think that's a valid viewpoint and one which independent journalists and whatnot have brought up that the tour pushes cyclists past any point of reason. And so perhaps it follows that there is some element in addition to all those po more positive elements that is just a certain tolerance for punishment on top of all those other things. Yeah. Well, I think that might be a good place to, uh, to end it there. Um, is there anything else you wanted to bring up? I don't I don't think so. You know, I think that it might you know the only thing I guess I would say on top of it is that it's my hope that you know even if I I think that it's not written in a conventional sporting narrative way. I really wanted people to engage with the sum of the parts which is not just the race itself but the war and the process of rebuilding and so, you know, ultimately it's my desire that you know, if you come into this just as a tour fan or someone who's just as interested or just interested in World War One, the the kind of entire relationship between those parts, you know, you'll maybe hopefully take something away from the parts that you maybe didn't go into the book expecting. Yeah, I would hope so too. And I think that's, you know, I think it's an important lesson that there's, you know, everything is connected and there's these sort of threads of connection that exist between sort of these different worlds, these different spheres of life. And I think this book does a great job highlighting that. And I think, like you said, if you're into World War One, or if you're into sporting events or cycling or, you know, really any of those things separately, you're, this is an interesting thing that sort of connects these things together. And 
I do think it's a worthwhile read if you're interested in any of those topics. I'm really glad you think so. Yeah, so thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. And uh, best of luck 